right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Honest Defense Podcast. This is Eric Cervone. Today, I am honored to be joined by John Hasnas. John is a professor at Georgetown University Law Center and Georgetown's McDonough School of Business. He's also the executive director of the Georgetown Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics. John has written some of my favorite pieces of academic legal writing, including The Myth of the Rule of Law, The Obviousness of Anarchy, and recently, 10 Questions About Democracy. What makes John's work unique is that most legal scholarship is very dry and boring. It usually seeks to promote some minor incremental change in a niche area of the law. But John's work really forces the reader to think from first principles about the very nature of law and government. It's what the founders of this country did. It's what few serious thinkers do today. Uh, we're going to be talking about some radical ideas. John, we were just talking before recording. John doesn't think his writing's radical. I think to the general public, it's it's pretty radical. But I think it's important to talk about these kind of ideas and to taste test our basic assumptions about how the world works. So, John, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. So I want to start talking about the myth of the rule of law. Before we get into the essay itself, you originally published it in 1995. It was an academic article. It's it's gotten some traction among people who are interested in in these ideas. Again, in thinking from first principles, I read it when I was uh, in my first year of law school. I'd done an internship with the Institute for Humane Studies. We were reading those types of of articles, but it really has gained some popularity recently because Michael Malice, who's a podcaster and a writer who has a big audience, included it in his Anarchist Handbook, which is kind of a, a compendium of a bunch of of radical essays and. I told you this before we started recording. You didn't know this book hit number one. It was the number one bestseller on Amazon nonfiction for, I believe, several days. Uh, so I'm curious about your thoughts on that and, and why you think there's a popularity in, in these ideas today. Okay, so you asked me why I think there's popularity. And the honest answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> but, so I wrote it in 1995. Made sense to me. It served a, a useful purpose then because like you, I was associated with the Institute for Humane Studies and I was lecturing for them. And I wanted a presentation that would push the thinking of the people who were listening and get them to question some underlying assumptions and beliefs. So it was written intentionally to be a little bit provocative. And it was also written in a somewhat entertaining way because if you've read it, you know there's a quiz in there I ask the readers to take, and there's a couple of stories based on characters from a now obsolete television show, which was popular in the 1990s. But it was basically designed to um, get people to question some assumptions and push their thinking. Maybe that's why it's popular. Uh, maybe that's why it's lasted so long. But having said all of that, that speculation, why it's popular now, I don't know, maybe it's just that some people, like the person who published that um, handbook, are pushing it so it's getting a higher profile. And even, I've heard Michael Malice talk about it, he, he doesn't understand how it got to number one. You know, he thought that this would go out to his audience, and he, again, like I said, he has a sizable audience, but I don't think anyone expected it to be number one, so it's kind of a shock to everyone. When when he first asked you to include the essay into the into the book, did you just kind of say yes, not thinking it was going to be anything? Oh, well, if people request permission to publish my writings in books, I just say yes. Right. The idea of writing it is to have people read it. I'm an academic. Right. So for most academics, our life experiences, we write things, they're published, and no one ever reads them. Right. But we, the fact that this might cause people to read my work is a benefit to me. So I've said yes to several things. I said yes to this. I just said yes to somebody translating it into Polish. <laughs> it's fine with me. Yeah. Oh, that's I, 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 just, I just don't give it much thought. And if a lot of people read it, that's good. Well, and like I said, most academic writing, especially legal writing, it seems like the, the authors, they want their writing to be used and cited as much as possible, which is why they, they kind of avoid any kind of radical or theoretical propositions. They want they want their, their writing to be used either in the industry that they're writing for, or they want it to be cited by judges. And so this obviously wasn't going that direction. Is that, has that been the focus of your career academically? Or have you just been more interested in the theoretical works? No, I'm afraid I'm like the traditional academics you just described. <laughs> so a lot of my work is not written for a general audience. A lot of my work is about whether it's proper to convict corporations 
of offenses or only individuals. And that's really written for the legal community. And the effort is to try to reform legal practices. Uh, so a lot of my writing is like that. As an academic, that's my job. Every so often, I get to write something that I think is intended for a more general audience or for a non-professorial audience. So the myth of the rule of law is like that. There's several others. The, the, um, the obviousness of anarchy is like that. It was requested for a collection in a book of essays. So that's sort of the fun part of my job when I don't have to be in a traditional academic mold. I've just been alive long enough and I've gotten old enough. So I've done that several times now. Right. Uh, but it's, it, it can't, it, unfortunately, it's not the majority of my work. Right. I, I can kind of collect them and read them all at once. So it does, it, to me, it feels like, oh, this is what this guy does. I get it. Okay. So the, the thesis of the myth of rule of law, I, I think there's, in my head, when I read it, there's, there's kind of two theses. And the first, I would say, is actually kind of less radical. It's you know, the idea that most people think of law as being this objective body of work that can just be written down and applied uniformly. And your argument is, is that's really just not true. Uh, is that kind of an accurate depiction? Yes, it is. Um, we see massive battles over the latest Supreme Court nominee and whether that person will be approved or not, which suggests that everybody believes the law is determined by the pre-existing opinions of the people who are judges. But as soon as we're not focusing on that, then we think the law is neutral and objective and it should be just objectively applied. Most people are able to hold both opinions in their mind, as long as they don't hold them at the same instant in time. So the article that you're asking me about basically was designed to say one or the other has to be the case, not both. And pretty clearly, it's not the case that the law is some kind of neutral thing that's objectively applied because that's impossible. Right. And, and like you said, you include this quiz, you talk about the First Amendment, which is the, the most clear example of, of how the law can't be interpreted objectively, because the First Amendment's written as clearly as you could write a law, which is Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. And you include this quiz. Well, well if you read the sentence, do you agree that Congress can prohibit citizens from revealing military secrets? And, and most people would say, well, yeah, of course, Congress can prohibit that. And well, if you say that, then that's kind of not the usual interpretation of make no law. And similarly, you also say, well, the, do you agree that Congress can pass a law prohibiting dancing uh, at, to rock and roll music? And most people say, well, no, Congress can't do that. And then, well, if, if you're using the First Amendment to justify that opinion, well, that's an unusual interpretation of freedom of speech. Dancing, we would not typically define as speech. Uh, so. I think critics would say, well, that's why we have judges. That's why we have a living constitution, because we, we need to be able to adapt our laws to the changing time. So what's, what's wrong with that interpretation? Nothing's wrong with that interpretation. That interpretation is basically the point. What you've just said is the law is not controlling outcomes. It's the people who are the judges, the human beings who are making decisions are what control the outcome. We, you know, anyone who is on one side or the other side of an issue, will say, this is what the law requires and it will be a matter of interpretation. But then they'll represent it to the public as, that's not me. Right. That's the neutral and objective law and you all have to obey it because the rule of law is important. You're, you're right. Um, one of the examples I think I use in that article, if not, I certainly use it frequently, is the constitutional interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause because at one point, that meant that separate but equal was constitutional because it's just equality. And by 1954, separate but equal was inherently unequal. And the words haven't changed. The interpretation has. And by the present, um, the Equal Protection Clause allows all kinds of affirmative action and racial decision making. Now, over the last 100 years, more than 100 years, it's not that the words are changing or that the law is controlling things. It's the people who are applying it are making the difference. I forget who it was. One of uh, a constitutional scholar a while back pointed out, I think that 85% of the Supreme Court's constitutional decisions interpreted only four words, <laughs> which, was, which were equal protection and due process. Now, it's not as though those four words are determining the outcome of cases. 
Right. It's the um, the beliefs, the interpretation of the individuals, and the point of the article I wrote is just to point, show that what the law is is determined by the moral or pre-existing political beliefs of the people who do the interpreting. Also, that's not original with me. All I'm doing is channeling the legal realists from the beginning of the 20th century and hopefully presenting their ideas in at least a little bit more entertaining manner. But it, it's a, a very old argument that's made that I'm making in that article. Maybe I'm just popularizing it. So is, is your argument really a critique of the status quo, or is it a critique of the interpretation of the status quo? Because it, like, it seems like you're, you're agreeing that the, the status quo is laws adapt and, and they're flexible and, and they're interpreted subjectively. And are, are you necessarily saying that's a bad thing, or is it just that you're trying to open people's eyes to, hey, this is just the way the world works? Um, I, I'm going to say that the answer to that is neither. Right, and I'll try to explain why without taking up all your time. <laughs> Take as much time as you want. That's the beauty uh, of this. So that was written in 1995. And that, that article reflects my beliefs then, and it's still my beliefs now. But that article is about legislation. It's about the kind of law that comes out of Congress or comes out of the state legislatures, which is determined by the political, um, it, the political pressures and the political factors that are driving the people who are making the law. Legislation is consciously created law by people who are political representatives, and that almost always serves a political interest, even though they depict it as serving the common interest or the public interest. But that's not the case. I've written more since then, but the point of my work usually is to acquaint people with the fact that there's two types of law. One is legislation, and that's what we're all familiar with, and the problem is that's what we learn from time where kids on, that the, they get the little kids like me in public school and they make us watch jailhouse rock videos about the bill sitting on the steps and then going through. And everyone thinks that was that's what law is. But actually, the majority of the law that sustains our prosperous and commercial society was never legislated. There's something else called common law, which most people are completely unfamiliar with, but contract law and property law and tort, which is personal injury law, commercial law, all of the things that keep us going and regulate our relationships to others came from another source. It wasn't created by politicians. It wasn't created by representatives. It evolved because it solved actual needs and composed disputes between people and let us cooperate. And when we learned how to cooperate, the law became stable and it continues. So my work is mostly to say, look, there's two types of law, common law and legislation. The article you're asking me about now, the myth of the rule of law, is saying the idea that what comes out of the legislative process, which is created by politicians, isn't neutral and objective. It isn't the embodiment of justice. It's not necessarily serving the common good. It will be serving the interests of the, the political interests or the moral interests of the people who make it. And then the rest of my work since then has sort of has been trying to get people today to look at the other part of our law. That's the myth of the rule of law. Some of my later work says the rule of law doesn't have to be a myth. If it's a nation in which the law is created by common law processes, because that's law and it's binding and it is, it is coercive in a sense that people have to follow it, but it's not created by any individual human being. It's not created by any particular will. It evolves because it settles disputes. That's what keeps society functioning. You would like to have a commitment to that kind of law. It's just that we don't want to confuse that kind of non-consciously created law with what comes out of legislation. The, the last thing in this, it, it's sort of a Hayekian approach to law. Hayek had a lot of um, understanding of economics and the way spontaneous order can develop economically. He didn't quite, uh, he tried to, but he didn't quite apply that to the field of law effectively. But I think his insights apply to the field of law just as well. And my examination of legal history suggests that you know, a Hayekian approach to law gives a pretty good account of the part of our law that works well. So that's to fill in the, what, 25 or 30 years since the article has been written. There, there's such a beauty to 
that view of of the common law of the evolution of it of the spontaneous order of it that it's not taught in law school people are always shocked when, when i when i explain to them in law school we're not taught first principles we're not even taught about you know in, in constitutional law we didn't spend two minutes on the constitutional convention we don't we don't spend you learn that the common law is judge made law that's that's basically all you learn about common law is just that basic definition of it you don't learn about the evolution of it we're we're kind of taught in law school that the legislation is the modern form of law that, that that's that's the natural evolution of laws that yeah we went from this kind of informal common law system to well now we we are adv an advanced society and we write down our laws how did you start going down this this train of thought because uh, you're not taught that in school you're right my experience in law school was the same as yours um i went to law school i got the typical law school training but after law school i went to graduate school in philosophy for a phd and the dissertation I wanted to write, and I was going to write, was about criminal law, was about when you can convict someone of attempting a crime. Because that was an interesting question I encountered in my first year of law school and criminal law, and I wanted to answer it. So in writing my dissertation, I was, of course, doing theory, but I didn't feel comfortable just being an abstract theorist. I wanted to show there's some grounding. So I decided I'd have to look into legal history. And I'd gotten through three years of law school with no knowledge of legal history or anything else, just like you. In writing my dissertation, I started looking at the where criminal law came from and how it developed. And it is, was as though you know, my eyes were open and I realized this, you have to look at this. I, criminal law is, uh, it took centuries for criminal law to develop enough to replace the underlying order system that had come about through common law mechanisms. And the reason for the development of criminal law was not to provide order. It was to allow the king and the government to extract the wealth of the citizens. And it, it was rent-seeking. I sometimes call it royal rent-seeking. And once you see the legal development, all of a sudden, you notice that the kind of law that really works well is the law that evolves. And the kind of law that comes out of the government is almost always skewed away from settling human problems and toward advancing certain political interests. So I came to it late. I came to it after law school. I came to it as a accidental feature of working on my dissertation. But once you start seeing this, it sort of uh, it gets you, it creeps into your unconsciousness, and then pretty soon it's everywhere. And most of my work since has an element of legal history in it that explains why the law is something that can evolve organically and you don't need to trust politicians to give up. And the rules that come out of the legislation almost always creates more strife rather than settles disputes. If you look at what people are up in arms about, I've never seen an example where people are out in the barricades because they're upset with some common law rule. It's always something that the politicians just passed. They're either for or against abortion. They're, they think that there should be more or less economic regulation. But I haven't seen anybody protesting contract law or certain features. I mean, the law that works is the law that evolves. The law that gives rise to dissension and strife is the law in which some people try to impose their will on all of society, and there are those that resist. So the common law sort of leads in the cooperation and peaceful direction. Legislation tends to lead in the political conflict direction. And since it's all law, there's two different types. Most of my work is trying to push people in the direction of common law. At the beginning, you said I, I didn't see my work as radical. I'm unable to see my work as radical. Why? Because all I'm doing is saying, just look at the world. Right. But you're looking at the world, you're seeing politics. You're ignoring all of the world and all of the law that evolves outside of politics. And so you think things have to be a certain way. I'm not being radical. I'm saying, look, just look at the world the way it actually is and what works, and your opinion will change. So for me, everybody thinks my work's very radical. It seems to me I'm just, it's a matter of common sense, and I'm just asking you to look around. Um, but I'm willing to take the, uh, the title of being some kind of, radical it's it's i guess entertaining in some way <laughs>
Well, radical gets it gets this negative connotation to it because people think, well, the, the status quo is, I guess, just inherently good and any deviation from it's bad. And and you're saying, well, well, no, if you look in the past. And I think that's part of why you don't see yourself as radicals, because you're, you're such a student of history. If you, you said, well, this worked really, really well for a very long time, and it's only in recent history that we've, we've made these changes. And really, the, the changes are the part where, that we're fighting over. This new part is the part we're fighting over, the politics and, and everything. So I think that's part of why you're able to, to see yourself as not radical. But what, what's most radical, I think, is this idea you talk, you write about it in, in I believe, the myth of rule of law is how some of the old English courts actually competed against each other. And it was the, the litigants or, or the disputants that paid the courts. And so there was competition among what courts would be used. And I think that's the part people have trouble wrapping their heads around is that, well, why don't we need one set of laws so that people can understand, hey, wherever I live, these are the rules, as opposed to if, if I have competing courts in the same physical area, how do I know what I can and can't do? Yeah. I guess I'll give you an analogy. I know I've written about that, but to be honest, I don't remember which article. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going back. I mean, this, these so, articles were written when, when I was an infant, so I'm sorry, I, mean, I know I'm going back in history here. Yeah, some of it's in the myth of the rule of law. Some of it is in other articles like the depoliticization of law or the, I got one, is there a duty to obey the law? But it, it's in there somewhere. And I do write about that. Um, the analogy is this. In the beginning of this country, there was no government-issued currency. And lots of banks issued their own currency, and were, that's the way commerce was, was carried on. At some point, the federal government started issuing what are the greenbacks and the, the dollars that we now use, and it became a government monopoly. But things functioned pretty well for a long time without that. There's an analogy to the law in the sense that until really 1873 in England, there was never a monopolistic body of law that was issued by the government. In English history, there were many, many, many courts. Eventually, as the King of England took over the legal system, there was, it got reduced to four courts, which were all royal courts. But those four courts, as I write in my article, were all housed in the same building in Westminster, and the reason why law courts are called benches is because there were benches at the four sides of the building, and the four courts were, you know, you could see each other. And when one court wasn't functioning well, the lawyers and the litigants would go someplace else and then and lose business. Fees were collected out of from the litigation. It was a market for order providing rules or a market for law. And that's the way the English law evolved. By 1873, there was only law and equity. It was two different branches. And then in England, they were combined into one. And we got a monopolistic system of law rather late. But today, we think it's necessary. An example I often use, my, my grandfather, my uncle, even my father, they came to this country early in the 20th century before Social Security. And there was no Social Security. People provided annuities for themselves in various ways. My family was part of a immigrant group system that provided for life insurance and um, annuities. And that was the stories we got. But if everybody born more recently thinks social security has to be provided by the government and it's a natural monopoly, and if you don't have it, there wouldn't be anything like that. So this is sort of everybody sees the world from the time they're in as what is the case now necessarily had to be the case. Another example I use is the New York City subway system, right? It's the Metropolitan Transit Authority. It's a government monopoly. It has to be. But then how do you explain why the names of the different lines are the Interborough Rapid Transit and the uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan Brooklyn Transit? It's because those are the names of the private companies that created the subways originally and were only taken over by the government in 1940. So law is like that. It's an, it's an analogy, but law is like that. The law evolved in certain in, in the market type situation where there was competition. It was taken over by the government later. Once the government takes over, then competition ends and it becomes a political competition. What should the law be? Well, how many votes can we get? How can we get people to vote for us? 
what can we get through the legislative process by agenda control? All of the public choice comes in and law becomes determined by those forces. Before, when it's determined by competitive choices, the law can never get too far away from what people actually need. And when the King of England gets too involved, he says, I, I, I want to make sure I, they can't escape my taxes. So something called the statute of uses is passed, which means it was a way of getting more taxes. People go out and figure out how to get around that by going to one of the alternative court systems like equity. And they have some check on things. As long as there's competition, as long as there's more than one forum, the law can't get too far away from the actual needs of human beings. Once politicians have a have univocal control, it can be anything. And I'll suggest that as we see today, it is anything. I mean, just think about what people believe today and who the people in Congress are and what they're arguing about. Is does any can anybody possibly believe that they'll give us a set of rules that are designed to achieve the common good or even make sense or internally consistent? Right. No, and, and that's why I think that part of your argument really isn't radical, because I think more and more people, especially now, are are understanding, uh, yeah, this, we're, we're not getting objective people who are, who are setting the law that, that is applied equally to everyone. So I people seem to be questioning the status quo, uh, maybe more than ever. I, I don't know. I'm, I, you know. I haven't been around that long, but it seems like more than, than at least in my adult lifetime, and it's just – that they can't quite get to, okay, well, the solution is we need to do something very different than what we're doing, as opposed to, you know, people want to have term limits or campaign finance reform. What are your thoughts on, on kind of those, those tweaks to the current system of democracy or, or representative democracy? All right. So now you've moved on to one of the other articles <laughs> that you mentioned, which is I had an article that came out recently called 10 Questions About Democracy. That was written because my institute sponsors symposia, and we had a symposium on the ethics of democracy. So I wrote an intro introductory piece. But um, my view of democracy, I can't express my view of democracy without reference to Orwell's 1984. So 1984 was about, Newspeak was about how you can reduce the scope of what people can think about by manipulation of language. And especially in the last 30 years, we've lost the ability to talk about a classical liberal society or a free society. Because look at, look at all of the news today, especially yesterday with it being January 6th. Everybody is talking about American, the United States losing its democracy, where our democracy is being challenged. It's our democracy. And again, this is sort of a digression, but even in 1989, when the Chinese students were protesting against their government in Tiananmen Square, and they erected a Statue of Liberty, that, that was called the goddess of democracy, not the Statue of Liberty. What's happened is we've gone from a society in which individual freedom and liberty is the preeminent underlying value and democracy is a mechanism for preserving it, and it's only justified to the extent that it serves that end, which is why we want it to be curtailed, which is why the Senate is not based on representation and why senators weren't elected originally and why there's all kinds of checks on what government can do and why the founders were talking about the danger of faction and the kind of demagoguery that they knew happened in ancient Greece. We had a system designed to preserve liberty. It had democratic elements, and the democratic elements were means to an end. That's over. Right? Now we're a democracy. All people are fighting about is the right to vote, because what matters is we should be, the majority should get to make all of the rules and do whatever they want to. So if the law that comes out of the legislative process doesn't allow the government to impose vaccine mandates across the country, that's not a problem. Just do it anyway. And if you get enough votes, it's okay. We are, we are now drowning in a sea of democracy. And because people haven't, people can't distinguish freedom from democracy, they think they're supporting a free society when they're asking for more democracy. Democracy is simply controlled by 
not even the majority, controlled by the people who can gain political power by the manipulation of voters. And that's the situation we're in. You know, the, the interesting thing about democracy, since you talked about history, was when I was in college, instead of doing the work I was supposed to do, I used to go read ancient history because I thought it was fun. And I was like not doing my real work. You, it's great to read um, the Thucydides and the account of the Athenian democracy. Like, we talk about the democracy of Athens as though that's what we want to pattern our government on. Well, Athens became when Athens became a democracy, it was a far-flung commercial empire, the most powerful city-state in ancient Greece. 30 years of democracy turned it into a defeated country that was governed by 30 tyrants from um, Sparta. In the middle of a war, the majority, the democracy, decided to execute its 10 top generals. It sent an expedition to um, Syracuse. The person who created the expedition and the plan, they exiled for impiety, and they put the opponent of the expedition. If you want an example of how democracy works, you should look at Athens. Right. And then you'll see that we're creating that effectively in this country now. The problem, to go back to the beginning, the problem is we've conflated democracy and freedom. People don't know how to ask for freedom anymore. They want freedom. They keep on asking for democracy. And as a result, we get more and more of political warfare because democracy is a zero-sum, winner-take-all, losers-out game. So why do people behave? Why do people lie? Why do people completely misrepresent reality? Because in democracy, you win or you do nothing. The, the, most, the best example of this came when Bill Clinton defeated Robert Dole in 1996. And after they, they were still so much friendly. Afterwards, Dole was meeting with Clinton. And basically, he said, famously said, well, why did you lie about my social security proposals? And Clinton answered, well, you got to do what you got to do. And what he meant was, even if you think you're going to do good, you don't get to do good unless you get elected. You have to get the power. You have to do what you have to do, or you do nothing at all. That's the nature of democracy, and that's highly destructive of human cooperation, of peaceful interaction, of the kind of things that I like to argue comes out of the common law process. I, obviously, I'm fairly anti-democratic. Well, and and you talked about 1984, and where I see the the news speak is like you said, when people say the word democracy, they put a lot into that word, and it usually just means anything good about America. And so it's very hard to criticize democracy to a general audience because in their heads, democracy just means well, that's all the good stuff. That means freedom. That means liberty. And and so I, I think part of it is kind of having to deprogram it and actually say, hey, no, this is actually what democracy is. So like you said, point to Athens and point to real examples of this is what pure democracy looks like. Like, but so you know, you you mentioned that you know, we have that's this. Right. I, I agree Please. with that. I, I agree with that, and I think that's also the way the phrase "the rule of law" is used. Yes, the rule yeah. of yours it, law is something that's good, and of course, what that means it's what I. In two thousand, when it was a Bush Gore controversy, both sides constantly accused the other of violating the rule of law. Right, it's the same thing. <laughs> And, and that's I was going to ask you about that. You 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 say you know we have this phrase America is a government of laws and not of people. You know, that's the phrase everyone likes to say. And uh, and you, you write in in the article that that's part of the myth is that of course we're not you know of course we're we're a, a, we're ruled by people because it's people writing the laws, people interpreting the laws. Is sh should that at least be a a goal? Like should we try to strive to not be a government of people and more a, a government of laws? Like. Is there a distinction between, let's say, America and the Soviet Union, which was very clearly a government of of the people, of the leader, of the czars? Is, is there is there some sort of uh, is there a sliding scale, I guess, between being a government of laws and government of people that we should try to strive towards one side? Yeah, a sliding scale or a spectrum is the correct way of representing it, I think, because it's not a principal difference. So the Soviet Union, I think, was much more repressive and much more, um, it's much, it's much worse than government in the United States at a comparable time along a sliding scale. But it's not a principal distinction between whether it's a government of law or a government of people. 
it's a lot of things. Part of it is cultural, part of it is traditional history, part of it is that we were blessed with a, an original structure of government that was designed to make governing difficult. And it took 2000, 200 years for people to um, effectively emasculate all of the impediments to government power that were built into the Constitution, so it took longer. Mm -hmm. But there is a concept, I, the rule of law versus the rule of people, there is a concept that makes sense. Right? If you're going to have, you're always going to have some people who are in the law enforcement business, they're all, you're always going to have some matter of interpretation. Human beings are what they are. The difference is this. Are the laws being made consciously by people invested with power? Or are they evolving with nobody in control? The laws are still binding. And the laws are still going to be open to interpretation by human beings. But if they're not being created consciously by people with political, moral, economic interests, they're much more likely to be the kind of laws that allow us to cooperate. The other feat, the common law is not better than legislation as far as, there's no genius behind it. Right. The nature of the common law and the thing that makes it better is that it's self-correcting. So when you have common law rules that work well, they're repeated. When you have common law rules that are stupid or create or, or don't, then there's more and more litigation. The litigation load goes up, and then finally somebody tries something else, and it's a new rule. And if that's bad, the same thing happens. But eventually, we stumble on something that allows people to cooperate. It's a trial and error way of creating law where the errors tend to get wiped out and we learn as a result. I teach torts. So some of my cases for assault and battery are from the 14th century or from the 16th century. Those are the first ones in the case book. Why? Because we figured that out a long time ago. Right. Yeah, those are still good. The, now, the cases where there's a lot of controversy now would concern the internet, new reproductive technologies, the social media, because we don't know how to um, use those technologies correctly. 30 years from now, when my students are teaching, that'll be, uh, my students always want to know why there's so many cases in the casebook about railroads. <laughs> it's because when the cases came up, railroads were new important. technology. Right. We had to learn what safety meant. And that will be the case in the future. The common law process means the law in the present is always wrong, but it's self-correcting. And it, it'll still be wrong in the future. It will just be different problems. That's different than the law being created consciously by people who are pushing agendas. And the legislation can't be changed unless there's political repeal. That you go into dead ends and you're stuck forever. So this is a, again, this is a long answer, but the rule of law can make sense if you're talking about common law, because then there's no people in control of others. If you're talking about legislation, it always is people making rules for others, and that's always going to be the rule of people and not law. So I think one of the criticisms of a common law system would be, yeah, that makes sense in the 1700s and the 1800s and the 1600s because we had smaller societies. People didn't travel outside of, of their towns, and so you can make these decisions in a decentralized local way. But now, like you mentioned, social media, we, we have these giant international corporations that have so much power. And some people who people who even believe in limited government in other contexts would say, well, the only way to kind of combat or, or control this this power, this monopoly power that these big tech companies have is through the political method. Uh, how would you how would you respond to that? Like could there be a modern decentralized common law system given the international economy that we have? Yeah. Um, on this I hear this point I hear that a lot. And I'm not sure I have a good answer because I just think it's 180 degrees wrong. It's exactly the opposite of the case. When you have small groups together and living in local conditions, then it's at least possible for human beings to exert control and provide rules that make sense because you know each other. As society grows and becomes more complex, it becomes impossible for human beings to create rules which will effectively govern people and know how it works. The, the Industrial Revolution made it impossible for government to regulate the economy. Today, with the massive amount of new technologies, why 
the government is regulating all the time. I, I, I don't, I don't, right now the government's decided that in order to encourage electric vehicles, we should spend millions or billions of dollars creating charging stations all over the country. Whereas other people said, what you do is just have batteries switched out and you go to regular gas stations, your batteries are used up. They, they take it out, they put a new one in and you keep going like that. That seems to make sense to me. Right. Are we going to have that? No, because regulation or central control decides which way we go, whether it makes sense or not. As things get larger and more complex, the need for trial and error becomes ever more urgent. The Hayek was all about human beings having limited knowledge and limited ability to see things, but each individual has a good idea of what works within his own range, his or her own range of perception and knows what his or her own needs are. The more complex things get, the more crucial market relations and interactions free from government control become in order for us to learn what works. And so the reason why so many things don't work now is because we cut off the learning process. I'm not for markets because it's written in the heavens that markets are good. I'm for markets because human beings have limited intellectual capacities. Also because I'm a PhD and I know what other professors are like and the last people you want to trust to govern your life are other PhDs. Uh, but that's just aside from that, the, we need, human beings need problems. They need to try many different ways of solving the problems. If 99 people get it wrong, that's fine because somebody stumbles on the right answer. We all learn and that's how we make progress. I'll, digre I'll digress. I think this is um, indicative of something else, I believe, which accounts for a type of polarization. Today, everybody wants to talk about political polarization. I find that uninteresting because I'm not interested in partisan matters. But there is a kind of intellectual polarization that's probably more dangerous and at the root of a lot of um, social strife today. And it's this kind of thing. There are a lot of people who are dedicated to justice and they want the world to be just now. They see injustice everywhere and they want to fix it. And so they are, if you, if you see injustice anywhere, the world is wrong. If it's a little bit racist, it's racist. And what we have to do is make radical changes now to eliminate injustice. That's admirable, and that's one view. There's another group of people, sometimes they're economists, sometimes they're just market-friendly people, who think differently. We think that you can't make the world just now. If you are living in a world where things are bad, but each year they're getting a little bit better, and you're just constantly getting a little bit better, then over time, the world gets much, much, much better. This is sort of the idea of marginal effects. If you live in a society in which each year things are getting a little bit better, then you already live in utopia, and you shouldn't mess with that. The idea to do better almost always will produce other ill effects. I think the example that was given, I hate this terminology because I'm not an economist, but there's something, Pareto optimality is the point at which the things are as good as they can be, but the effort to make them better will actually have other effects that will make them worse. But you never know when you're at that point. So if you live in a society in which things are consistently getting better, you might be at the Pareto optimal point. And the effort to correct something that you can see is consciously correct it now rather than let it evolve over time will make things much worse. I think that's a pretty good example of what's going on now. I'm, I'm old. So the difference between you know, when I was a kid, our big concern was the world was going to get blown up in a nuclear holocaust because there were missiles in Cuba. Right. That's pretty serious, right? Now there might be some missiles in Iran or something like that, but it's, it's not the same. The same thing when I was a kid, there was legally enforced segregation. Now everybody's into diversity and inclusion and, and everything else. Is there racism in the country? Yeah. But over time, the gradual increase produces a different world. And if you don't look at that, if you just look at the president and see everything that's wrong, 
you want to fix it now. Us old people, we've seen what happens over time with gradual improvement, and we realize that's the world we should be living in. And the result is you have polarization, intellectual polarization, between those who have to fix the world now and those who say, but look how much better it's gotten. And we don't even talk to each other anymore. You can't talk across that divide. I wish there was some way um, that that's the issue that could be engaged. Right. And, and that seems to be the problem. First of all, you keep saying you're old. You have much better hair than I do. So I will take <laughs> a few years for that hair. I'll trade you. But uh, I'm that, old, but on the basis of when I was born. <laughs> right, right, right. It does seem to be the problem is that you know, people can't even agree that, that things are getting better. I mean, we, we, we fundamentally disagree on very basic issues and basic ideas. And one of my favorite examples that you give in The Myth of the Rule of Law, you, you give this, this little thought experiment about the problem with one size fits all, literally one size fits all law. You talk about this world called this artificial world called monosizia, and it's this world where people can't remember why, but for, for hundreds of years, they just had this rule that when they made shoes, they could only make shoes in one size. And it was a, a constant argument back and forth about what size should those shoes be. There were the conservatives who believed in family values and thought shoes should be made for children. And you had the, the liberals who thought we need as much inclusion as possible. And so we should make big size shoes. And the, 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 you know, the, it, it shows the ridiculousness of kind of this political battle. Why can't there just be multiple shoe manufacturers that make shoes across all different sizes? And even even in your thought experiment, it ends sadly that you have this one guy named Socrates who realizes this, that why can't we just have multiple manufacturers and multiple shoe sizes? And he realizes he's not going to have any success in the political realm, and he actually goes off to become a, a PhD philosopher. Uh, and that that's that's the conclusion of that thought experiment, which is which is a little sad. But do you see? something happening in the future where people kind of realize we're not getting anywhere with these places. I mean, you, you, you brought the issue of, of abortion. I mean, that's something where even in that kind of thought experiment, there, there's no multiple solution. If, if you're living in the same society and, and half the society thinks abortion is murder and half the society thinks abortion is a human right, can there be a world where those people live together? Yes, but on this, you're asking a question in which I have no particular insight that's better than anybody else's. Um, I, I have opinions about nature of law and things like that. I also have strongly held moral and political positions. But when it's uh, questions about psychology or the possibility or political possibilities, I'm a lay person and my opinion is no better than anybody else's. Um, that particular issue is difficult because the views are so diametrically opposed, but the United States now is one country. And there, Texas and New York are part of, the, part of the same country. And the views on abortion, at least politically, are diametrically opposed and we're not at war. So that suggests to me that, yes, we can live together. Um, different communities will often have different internal rules. Um, I know some of the work I've done talks about, I'll advertise a colleague, David Beto is an historian at the University of Alabama. He's done a lot of work on immigrant communities, on black communities in the South, on things like that, and how these communities that are cut off from government services can provide their own services and their own rules and their own internal structure that allows them to function. In my case, I had lots of stories from my elderly uncle about how the immigrant Jewish community in Brooklyn functioned even though the government was controlled by the Irish and they had no you know, ability to get government services. People can live together with radically different beliefs as long as they're able to organize themselves internally. Um, if you have a system in which there's a government in which that government will make one rule for everyone, then that's no longer the case. And the chances of living together peacefully in that case, I think, go down because what you'll be engaged in is what we see now, a political struggle for control of the um, government that makes the rules. I mean, if it's going to be democracy where the politicians make the rules, then 
what choice do we have? You have to try to engage and win. And that's being said by somebody who refuses to vote and doesn't believe in democracy. Right. I, I understand the dy- dynamic in it. What are your thoughts? There's an idea of, of national divorce that started to gain traction. I, I just saw there was a poll of, I believe, of Southern Republicans. A third of them said that they support the idea of having certain states break away from the country as a whole. Is that a solution to this political issue of, of you know, people having to, to butt heads on, on all these issues? Well, you can go one of two ways. I, if you have a large nation that you want people to be able to live together in, one way to do that is to decrease the amount of power that's centralized, return to something more like the limited government that we had in the past, in which people interact freely and don't try to control each other's behavior, so we can go backwards. If you don't want that, if you want a democracy where the government controls all aspects of life, then the idea of breaking away seems much more reasonable. If you're, if you're a few states that are the minority, and you're never going to gain control of the federal government, and the federal government's not restricted by the um, by federal the concept of federalism, where states have power anymore, then you either be, decide I'm going to become a permanent minority, or I want to exit. If you're talking about government power, exit becomes more and more reasonable. It's a highly inferior solution to just simply reducing the amount of government power and letting people live the way they want to. But the cost of re-educating people about the difference between freedom and democracy is so high, there's a question about whether it's feasible anymore. Having said that, I don't want to sound negative. Having said that, one thing we all knew for sure when I was young was that the Soviet Union would last forever. (laughs) That was wrong. Things sometimes come crashing down. Think, if something is unsustainable, it won't last. And it could be that the kind of mentality we're in now is truly unsustainable. The, uh, just, uh, the blacklist was a terrible feature of the 1950s. Right. And it was highly oppressive. But it couldn't last. And you know, I'm a tort professor, so one court lawyer and a client, John Henry Falk, took on the blacklist and ended it. And that made the country much less just. Something like that could be going on again now. We have really, really oppressive behavior about what people can say and do. And there's a lot of features that are perhaps reaching the breaking point. I'd like to think that since this path is unsustainable, something will happen and it will be better in the future. But again, this is a layman's opinion. I have no idea what it will be. I'll keep writing articles advocating it, but of course, since no one reads it, it doesn't really have any effect. Well, again, I mean, you were in a number one bestseller, so there are people who are reading it. So I, I think you should be optimistic on that front. The obvious, in the obviousness of anarchy, and you you mentioned this that you you make this argument uh, over and over that just look around. You can look around that we have these these peaceful interactions with each other outside of government, and it's it's possible that you don't need political laws and forcing relationships we have. There's a concern, I think, always when you make that argument of, well, what happens if you just have – we, we, we touched on this. If you have corporations that gain so much power and, and you look at you know, the terms of services that we have to agree to, that, well, if there, if there weren't government laws, then we would just all be agreeing to different terms of services with these corporations. And already these terms of services are 300 pages that you have to agree to every time you're on a website with cookies, every time you use an Apple product. You know, we agree to these things, these contracts 100 times a day. And we don't know what's in them. We, we, we physically, I remember somebody calculated how much time it would actually take to read through all the terms of services. And it was, you know, something like 50 hours a day. It was something that, that's physically impossible. How, is, is that a concern of yours that with, without, you know, government law being as bad as it is and, and, and unreadable as it is and indeterminate as it is, would, would a, a country ruled by terms of services be even worse? Yeah. None of these things seem like problems to me. Again, it may be a, a generational thing. Um, General Motors used to be the most powerful corporation in the United States, maybe in the world. What happened to them? Uh, competition. Right. Uh, you, you, we don't have to, I haven't bought an American car in like 30 years. Uh, at one point, um, IBM was this monopoly. 
the government spent like 40 years suing IBM for antitrust. By the time they won the case, IBM was nothing. Uh, you're all worried about, you guys are worried about uh, social media. I'm not. I don't use any of it. This is what's good about being older. I don't know what any of that stuff is. I am on Facebook and I, I read things there sometimes, but life is perfectly livable without any of those things. As far as terms of service go and that kind of stuff, that, there's a part of our law that takes care of that and it's not government regulation. We've had contract law forever. Uh, if contract law is working well, then these problems get solved. If it's not working well, if what's happened is businesses have figured out how to do things that would be binding under old contract law in such a way that it's gaining all the power for itself and the agreements aren't really agreements because nobody reads them, then what will happen under common law is there will be enough lawsuits until the rules will change. The, the thing is, see, this is what I was talking about, about polarization. The current mindset is these things are not true contracts. They're unfair. We have to fix it now. The mindset of the person who takes a gradualist approach is the common law takes time to work. And if these are the problems that are coming up now, we need time for it to work out. In 1990, the most serious issue was junk science in the courtroom. The problem was that there was all this bogus stuff that was leading to lawsuits and people were suing for brain tumors because of cell phones. And the government, so we needed government regulation, but the 1990s government was divided and there wasn't regulation. And so by 2000, the common law process had solved the problem. A couple of cases had gone up through the Supreme Court and we had new rules that make it so that you never hear about that as a problem anymore. The kind of problems you're talking about, if we were patient or if we could just monkey wrench government or have enough divided government so nobody would deal with it, then 10 years from now, it wouldn't be an issue anymore and people would be complaining about whatever is the problem then. The legal system that we have, the common law legal system is always wrong in the present, but it works out answers through a trial and error process, which just imagine putting some of the politicians presently in power in charge of regulating the internet. Like what do you get? The Republicans used to be for internet freedom until the, until some of the social media didn't like what they were saying. Now they're all for regulation. Right. You really want to have those people making rules governing the way we communicate. Uh, the, the rest of the world is trying to suppress this kind of communication because people are using it against oppressive governments. I don't think the solution for the uh, abuses in the current system is to make it so that we don't have access to this kind of communication that we can use against our abusive government. Just have patience. The common law will work it out. That prescription is never accepted. It's not acceptable. It's never accepted. People just look at me and say, oh, you just have faith in the market or something like that. And it doesn't matter how much evidence I present that that's the, because they're in a mindset. Something's wrong. You have to fix it. Until we can stop that, um, the only hope we have is to monkey wrench government enough so that it can't function and enough time passes so the solutions evolve. So you're at Georgetown, which is one of the institutions that is most welded to the status quo of, of any in this country. How are your ideas received when you present them at, at your symposium or anywhere around campus? It's an interesting question. I want to be fair to my institution. I find Georgetown to be um, very monocultural. I mean, there's there's not much diversity of opinion, which is unfortunate. But at least personally, academic freedom means that I can advocate what I want to advocate. Generally, this is as far as my ideas go. I mean, many years ago, everybody found me amusing. I would just make my points, and they didn't have it. It wasn't going to affect them. They found it amusing. They didn't mind having me around. At some point, I got to a situation where maybe I can even make a difference, but inside both the business, or at least the business school where my main appointment is, we, there is academic freedom. We advocate what we advocate and people can disagree. And 
if uh, they don't want to listen to you, they don't listen. Having said this, that's very positive of sounding. Having said that, I think there is a difference in recent times with regard to things that you can say about race, sex, or anything else, or positions that you can advocate without being accused of um, harassment or something like that. And that is restraining the expression of ideas. So our symposium just this last October was on the ethics of freedom of speech. We'll have a lot of articles coming out on that. I've just written something on freedom of speech called Countering the Climate of Fear. It may not surprise you, but what I think is the solution to this is utilizing the common law. I mean, we have rules governing defamation. We have rules governing the intentional infliction of emotional distress. We have rules governing assault and battery. We have rules that restrain how people can act abusively to others. And we have contract law, which if the government, if the university makes an agreement that to give all of its students and faculty the widest freedom of speech that's possible, which is what our policy says, then it has to adhere to it. And if it doesn't, we could actually use lawsuits to enforce it. The reason why we don't is litigation costs are too high. You can't recover anything and it's not worthwhile. But the solution to that is something that the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education is working on, which is creating a pro bono legal group that will re represent people who are victims of this kind of suppression of their rights for free. And as I point out in the article that I've written, this doesn't change the behavior of admin, this doesn't change the behavior of anybody in universities except one party, and that's university council. University council is not interested in winning lawsuits against people who are suing the university. University Council is interested in making sure the university never gets sued. Right. And if there's a specter of lawsuits for suppressing people's speech rights or abusing people because of what they say, University Council will all of a sudden start to try to restrain administrators and perhaps have training processes that are that distinguish between what's real harassment and what's freedom of speech. And that could make a difference. Right. Again, this is one of the articles I've just written that I'm hopeful about, but probably will have no effect. Well, I, I'm, it's very, it's vital work. I mean, I've had a number of professors on here who have faced all sorts of sanctions and, and firings for, for just academic speech. So I think that's really, really vital work. And again, I know you're not on social media, but I can tell you your work is popular on social media. It's, it's being shared. Like I said, you're, you're in a uh, number one best-selling books. So I recommend people check out the Anarchist Handbook because it's, it's got a, a his articles from all throughout history. I mean, I think going back to the 1800s, you're one of the most recent ones, I believe maybe the most recent one in here, but it's a fascinating collection. I've been a fan of your work since I was a student. So really it's an honor professor has to be able to speak with you. Uh, I will link to the, the Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics in the show notes so people can check out what you're doing there. And, and th there's links to the publications uh, on your website there, but is there anywhere else I should direct people if they wanna check out your work? Well, I have a personal website, and all of the things I've written are listed. I mean, you can download it from there because I got permission to post these things. That means that people can get whatever I've written for free if they want. You can link to that. They'll find a lot of articles about corporate criminal liability, but interspersed among them, you know, the articles that are on these kind of topics and um, pure political philosophy. What's your personal website? Okay, good question. Uh, I can I can look it up and I'll, I'll make sure I include that in the show. It notes. used to, it used to be really easy because that, nobody in the North America has the same last name as us. Right. So it used to be if you put my name, it, it goes straight there. But uh, the university changed, and now it's hard to get to. If you do put my name into a website and go to Georgetown University 360, then there's a link in there that goes to my personal website. Otherwise, I don't know how to tell people to find it because oh, that's, that's, yeah, I don't use these the technology. I'm, I'm sure I am sure I found, I'm sure that's how I found some of your writing. So I'll just have to go back. That's not a problem. I'll make sure I include them in the notes. But Professor Hassas, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me.